matter in ecosystems. So oftentimes ecologists are interested in tracing the movement of energy and matter through the ecosystem. Notice this part in bold here. One of the most important ideas related to this topic is that matter is recycled through an ecosystem. The atoms that make up matter are used over and over and over and over and over. They're not used up. They don't go away. They move from one part of the food chain to another part and eventually they start over again. But energy flows through and eventually out of an ecosystem. It usually comes in as sunlight that's captured by some kind of photosynthesizer. And ultimately it usually leaves the ecosystem as some type of thermal energy or heat. So let's talk a bit about matter recycling. So we know that Let's, let's talk about a, an example with photosynthesis and respiration. So plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and some other nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil through the roots, and they use that to build their biomolecules. Animals eat the plants and they use those carbon atoms and oxygen atoms and nitrogen atoms and phosphorus atoms to build their own biomolecules. Well, those animals get eaten by another animal. Ultimately, those same carbons and oxygens and nitrogens and phosphoruses are used to build the next animal in the food chain. And that keeps going until eventually we get to the top of the food chain. That organism dies, decomposers break down that organism and the cycle starts over. But those atoms don't go away. They're recycled over and over again in the food chain. Here we can see some of that. So we see we're going from bottom of the food chain, producer, to primary consumer, to secondary consumer. Eventually decomposers break them all down, put those simple molecules and atoms back into the ground. They become available to plants again and the cycle starts over. So keyword there, matter is recycled over and over through an ecosystem. Unlike matter, we said the flow of energy through an ecosystem is one directional. It's um, one way. As I said earlier, energy usually enters an ecosystem as sunlight. It's captured in, into some kind of chemical form by photosynthesizers, like plants and algae, cyanobacteria. It's passed through the ecosystem, um, changing forms as organisms metabolize the biomolecules that they eat, make some waste. Um, each time that energy changes forms, some of it, in a lot of cases, a big part of it is converted into heat. Heat leaves the organism and goes out into the environment. It's still a form of energy. It's not destroyed, but typically it can't be used as an energy source by living things. And ultimately, all the energy that entered the ecosystem is gonna leave it as heat and it's gonna radiate back out into space. So because energy flows in this one directional manner, an ecosystem has to have a constant incoming supply of energy. And almost always, this is sunlight. So here we can see that we've got the sun providing the energy in. Each part of the, the, the food chain is giving off heat energy, which again was gonna radiate out into to space. Notice even the decomposers do that. So energy flows in as sunlight, it flows out of the ecosystem as heat. So you guys have seen food chains. You know that a food chain is a diagram that depicts the series of organisms that eat one another to get their energy and their nutrients. Food chains begin with an autotroph or a primary producer. The two major types of autotrophs are photoautotrophs Things like plants, algae, and cyanobacteria that use carbon dioxide and light energy to make their organic molecules like sugars. And then there are also chemoautotrophs. These are typically bacteria found near undersea volcanic vents that use the energy from, from certain chemicals, usually inorganic hydrogen sulfide to build organic molecules from CO2. Everything else in the food chain is a heterotroph or a consumer. These have to eat other organisms to get their nutrients and their energies. 
So the herbivores that eat the primary producers are the primary consumers. The organisms that eat the primary consumers are the secondary consumers. It's usually there's some kind of carnivore. Tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers. And if there's another level present, that next level up is called the quaternary consumer. Typically, the organisms at the very top of the food chain, regardless of what level we're at, are called the apex or top level consumers. Each of these categories, primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, these are called trophic levels. And each trophic level represents a link in a food chain. Now, even though they're not always shown, decomposers, things like fungi and algae, or fungi and bacteria rather, are considered to be their own trophic level. Um, there's even some multicellular animals like earthworms and crabs and slugs and even vultures that are called detritivores. These are decomposers, but they also help to, to make the, the decomposing material more available for the bacteria and the fungi by breaking it up and so forth. So decomposers eat dead matter and waste products from all of the trophic levels. And in addition to performing the role of decomposition, Maybe the more important thing they do is that they release the nutrients and the minerals from those decomposing waste and dead matter and put them back into the soil, back into the environment so they can be recycled. So we think of decomposers as mineral recyclers or atom recyclers, matter recyclers even. So here we see just a really basic food chain. We've got corn or maize. It's the producer, primary producer. The locust is the primary consumer, it eats the corn. The lizard is the secondary consumer, it eats the grasshopper or the locust. And the snake is the tertiary consumer, it eats the lizard. So oftentimes, because of the complexity of the diets of many things, food chains uh, are not completely accurate representations of what's really going on. In these situations, we need a food web. A food web is essentially many intersecting food chains put together. In a food web, arrows point from an organism that is eaten to the organism that eats it. And you'll see in the example we're about to look at, some organisms eat more than one other organism, and they may eat organisms from completely different trophic levels. Let's look at an example. Let's take the, um, let's take the leopard seal, for example. So the leopard seal um, eats fish. That's one of the things that it eats. Fish eat zooplankton or zooplankton, which eat phytoplankton. So that would mean this would be a producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. So in that particular food chain, the leopard seal is a tertiary consumer. But notice the leopard seal also might eat a penguin. So let's look at that, that food chain. So the seaweed is the producer. The crab is the primary consumer. The squid is the secondary consumer. The penguin is the tertiary consumer. That would make in this food chain, the leopard seal is the quaternary consumer. So the leopard seal is eating things from completely different food chains. We also could look at the, the seagull. The leopard seal also eats a seagull. So that food chain starts out with phytoplankton as a producer, zooplankton as a primary consumer, fish as a secondary consumer, seagulls as a tertiary consumer, and the leopard seal is a quaternary consumer. So let's talk about energy transfer through food chain or food web. So energy is transferred between trophic levels when one organism eats the, uh, the energy rich organic molecules in another organism's body. These energy transfers are very, very, very inefficient. Um, and because they're so inefficient, this, this limits not only the length of the food chain and the number of trophic levels, but also the number of organisms found at each trophic level. When energy is transferred to a new trophic level, some of it is stored as biomass in the bodies of the consumers. This energy is then available to the next trophic level. Only energy stored as biomass can be consumed. So as a rule, 
only about 10% of the energy that's stored as biomass in one trophic level ends up stored as biomass in the next trophic level. That rule of thumb, it's not always exact, is called the rule of 10 or the 10% rule of energy transfer. This essentially means that 90% of the energy uh, in one trophic level doesn't make it up to be stored in the next trophic level. 90% is essentially lost and unavailable. 10% makes it and is stored as biomass. Because of this really inefficient transfer of energy between levels, like I said before, the length of food chains is generally limited, usually to either three to six trophic levels. And the number of organisms at the upper trophic levels is extremely small because there's not very much energy available. So we're gonna look at a diagram on the next slide that sort of shows how this works. So our primary consumers, our plants, take in sunlight and store about 20,000 kilocalories per square meter per year of energy. Those are eaten by the primary consumers. Of that 20,000 kilocalories per square meter per year, only about 2,000 of that ends up being stored in the bodies of the primary consumers. Those uh, primary consumers are eaten by the secondary consumers, like the, the frog, for example, or the toad. Only about 200 of the 2,000 kilocalories from the second trophic level is stored in the bodies of the secondary consumers. The snakes eat the secondary consumers. Only about 20 calories of the 200 in the previous trophic level end up stored in their bodies. And then we've got the quaternary consumers, only about two kilocalories out of that original 20,000 ends up stored as biomass in there. So the question is, where does all the energy go? Because the key point is energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's not used up. It's just changed to another form. And notice one of those forms is heat. So as I said a second ago, if, if only 10% of the energy stored as biomass in a trophic level ends up stored as biomass in the next level, where's it go? The first law of thermodynamics tells us you can't create energy, you can't destroy it, it's not used up. So there's three possible ways that energy leaves the food chain. One of them is heat energy. And this is where a lot of it goes. Some of it is contained in undigestible waste. So some of the organic molecules that are eaten can't be digested. The energy in those molecules ends up in the feces. There's also some organisms in a level that don't get eaten. Not every plant gets eaten, for example. So there's still calories, there's still energy in those organisms um, that die before they're eaten. Eventually the feces and the uneaten organisms are consumed by decomposers. He gets released and at some point, all the energy that entered the food chain as light leaves the food chain as heat and radiates back out into space. So another way to, to represent the amount of energy that's stored in living tissues is to, instead of looking at an energy pyramid, like we looked at on the previous slide, look at a biomass pyramid. So this is showing you how much biomass is in each trophic level. So notice the grasses um, have way more biomass than the rabbits. The rabbits way more biomass than the wolf. And it's not perfect here, but notice this also is, almost follows that 10% rule. You can also look at what's called a pyramid of numbers. This shows you how many individual organisms are found at each trophic level. So aquatic plants, we've got nearly 12,000 the caddisfly larvae that feed on those plants, about 1,900. The fish that feed on the larvae, about 300. And the bigger fish that feed on the blue kills, only about 13 of those. So again, same kind of idea. Here we're looking at numbers of organisms. The previous diagram, we were looking at biomass of organisms. And in the first one, we're actually looking at energy. So we've got pyramids of energy, pyramids of biomass, and pyramids of numbers different ways to illustrate essentially the same relationship.